We begin our show today in the hills of northeast Victoria. It's where a farm-based engineering business makes and sends portable sawmills to all parts of the globe. The Lucas Mill has been so successful, someone somewhere in the world was bound to try and copy it. And that's just what happened to the Lucas family, which has fought to protect their product and their business from international piracy, as Tim Lee reports. The chips are flying as the saw blade rips out another hardwood plank. This portable sawmill is called a Lucas Mill, named after its Victorian developers, and it's a world beater. We've been number one in the world now since 1995, which is a pretty remarkable achievement. I don't think there's too many machines that can boast that. So, you know, it just has blown us away, the, I suppose, the success of the business and the demand for the product. In a vast workshop set into a hill on the Lucas family farm in northern Victoria, a skilled and willing workforce is busy building machines that will be sent to all parts of the planet. We did a tally about three or four years ago and I think we'd sold machines into 102 countries and I think there's about 210 countries all around the world. No doubt there's a few borders where our machines have snuck through and we don't know about it. Always trying to find new spots on the map to put pins in. Righto, Cliffy, we'll go down 65 mil again. 65 mil, good to go. For this highly inventive farming family, this portable sawmill has opened up countless horizons. Three quarters of what we manufacture is, is exported. So, uh, yeah, that's taken us to some pretty uh, interesting places. The wilds of Alaska the jungles of the African Congo, the giant redwood forests of the United States, remote villages in the New Guinea Highlands. These are just some of the destinations for these portable sawmills. So the product needs to be highly reliable. So every mill that goes out, it's been adjusted and it cuts timber before it gets shipped out. So basically when the customer gets it, it um, it's ready to cut timber. 75% of what we make go overseas. And the last thing you need is to be a native guy in um, P&G and you've got a mill that doesn't work. One of the key attributes is portability. Alloy and aluminium components keep the weight down, so machines weigh between three to 400 kilograms. It can be broken down into seven or eight components and either pushed or carried into the jungle or and set up on a log. A lot of people that buy our sawmills don't necessarily have machinery for moving logs around and especially when you get into third world countries and Pacific Islands they've got no machinery at all and they need to be able to take the sawmill to the tree which is more often than not a, a salvage operation and uh, portability is very important and that's one of our, uh, our strong points. Across Australia, there are countless trees that die from a range of causes. It could be drought or bushfire or insect attack, old age. Sometimes they simply topple over in a storm. But either way, unless that log can be taken to a sawmill to be used, often it's simply left to rot. But this machine can readily turn such wood into valuable timber. That aim was the impetus for the business. So too was the wool price crash of the late 1980s. When the bottom fell out of wool, we also had the recession. My kids all come back to the farm. We'd ch chase them all away. Back then, brothers Warren and Rex Lucas were steel workers, but their business took a sharp downturn. The farm had plenty of timber, so they took to cutting firewood. Soon the brothers reasoned they could make a mill that could transform low-value logs into usable timber. At field days, they looked at what was on the market. 
At these shows we saw a few portable sawmills and we got to thinking amongst ourselves that we could come up with a better design. So between Dad and Rex and I, we come up with pretty much the exact design that we've got now. Well, Rex built it, I instructed him on what to do and, uh, and uh, the first one came off the production line in uh, about March 1994. And we knew what the farmers wanted. They wanted a machine that could cut six inches and they wanted a machine that was half the price of anything on the market. Our business plan was 50 sawmills in a year. We would be happy with that. We got orders for 50 in the first six weeks. The way it took off, I could see that it, uh, we, were, we were on a, a winner from day one. Now their engineering business is a major employer. We've got 38 staff here, but I suppose the amount of people we employ extends beyond that because, you know, we've got uh, Jerry Ockman and his business up there that does all our casting. It's pleasing to know that we can uh, stick Australian made on it and in the main we use local, very local companies to make all our components. The major engine parts are cast at a foundry in nearby Beechworth. Molten aluminium at more than 700 degrees Celsius is poured into a sand mould. The part we're making here is a Lucas Mill, the main part that actually where the whole gearbox and the um, saw blade mounts on. It's a rotating swing frame, which they call the swing frame. Well, that's where the centre of the mill is. Lucas Mills is our biggest customer by, by far, and that's probably the, half the reason why we're here is because of Lucas Mills. Like, both ways, I've, um, I've met the guys a long time ago. I'm a pattern maker by trade, so I've made their original patterns and then we do the casting. Most of these things that we make here, apart from, I think, the bearings and the gears, the seals, I think everything else made locally. For any manufacturer, Increasingly tight regulations means a product must constantly evolve, especially when you're dealing with more than 100 countries worldwide. In recent times we've had to do major modifications to our fuel tanks just to pass emissions laws in California for fuel permeation through plastic and that gives us a few challenges because our fuel tanks are rated moulded plastic and we now have to do it in a, in a laminated process which has about tripled the cost. Fortunately, once again, a local Beechworth business is able to meet that challenge. We're rotationally moulding low-density polyethylene. Things like the Lucas saw guard, uh, their toolboxes, their water bottles, uh, their battery trays, and track ends, planer blade cases. And we do a variety of other small engineering things for them as well, and metal. Um, but yeah, in the plastics, that's the bulk of it. It's a big, big part of our business. We started uh, doing work for Lucas Mill in uh, about 97, so it's coming up 20 years, and uh, we've put apprentices through, and we're employing at the moment about six, and we're training up apprentices and, and work experience kids and whatever, so in a small town, it is a big thing, I think. But every successful product runs the risk of imitators. In the past, there have been others who've tried to sell machines that all too closely resemble the Lucas Mill. Yes, there has been a long-standing problem of Chinese companies infringing patent rights of foreigners. We've always been concerned that there would be a copier in somewhere like China, and uh, Matt, who's my right-hand man, spends a lot of time on the internet just keeping an eye on what our competitors are up to. And uh, in March 2014, he found a, a company in China that were uh, even advertising it basically as a, as a Lucas Mill. Then we hit them with a uh, fake uh, inquiry, and sure enough, they came back and told us that there was a, a Lucas Mill-like machine, not, not a Lucas Mill, so it was uh, a bit disappointing to see. But getting evidence strong enough to counter the counterfeiters in a Chinese court of law was a daunting and difficult task. It wasn't going to be possible to just uh, rock up at the factory in a small town in provincial China um, with a legal team and try to purchase a, purchase a $10,000 piece of machinery. The company employed a patent attorney firm in Melbourne. Its Australian legal team joined forces with Chinese patent lawyers and, crucially, a private investigator. 
We were able to detect when a particular sawmill was leaving the Chinese factory and uh, when it was passing through customs on its way out of the country. So uh, our Chinese lawyer tipped off Chinese customs. In a nail-biting sting, the Chinese sawmill was seized on the dockside. The machine themselves, even the gearbox, it's just a direct copy. The, every single fingerprint on our machine is um, being copied. When the crate was opened up, a Chinese judge was present and uh, he made the observation when he saw the instruction manual. He said to our uh, patent attorney in China, he said, uh, I think we've got him here. It's uh, how can it not be the same and yet they can use your instruction manual picture for picture and word for word translated to Chinese. It was the irrefutable proof the family needed. In late 2015, Lucas Mills was awarded damages of 2 million won, around 430,000 Australian dollars. However, the defendants appealed against that damages figure. Good morning. How are you going? A few weeks ago, a Chinese court reduced the compensation payout by half. So they reduced the amount of statutory compensation to 1 million won. A long and costly case cost way more than that, but it was never solely about money. We needed to protect our, our market and I suppose our product, all the research and development. We put years into developing and it's criminal that someone can come along and just copy that. So basically, for us, we didn't see we had any other option. That was going to be bad for business, uh, but also it was uh, the Chinese knockoff was inferior from a safety perspective, so potentially it could have damaged Lucas's safety reputation. The likelihood that we will get any money out of them is probably narrow, but we'll give it a shake. But the important thing is it has stopped them from copying us. And uh, China has unique copyright laws, which will probably give us uh, exclusivity in China for at least another 30 years. In China, a case like this is not all that unusual. But in Australia, the Lucas's legal victory is big news. I think it has created a deal of excitement in Australia because here you have an Australian company that succeeded in China against a Chinese company for, for patent infringement. So we, we're really, really proud, I suppose, that a little company in Australia can uh, stand up and, and, and protect its own, its own product. So, yeah, no, it was, it's a pretty good story, I think. Sawmilling is in the family DNA. Warren's mother, Tess, comes from a long line of forest workers. They're all too aware of the dangers of saw blades. My father-in-law was killed in a sawmill where uh, putting the boards over the saw is dangerous. He was killed in a sawmill accident at Wirri in 1964 in May, 52 years ago. Safety has been one of the greatest achievements of our mill. Yeah, well, tell us about your dam here. The engineering business has also allowed them to pursue their other love. We both grew up on farms and we've always wanted to, you know, own and run a farm. Um, and yeah, if we didn't have this business, it wouldn't allow us to, to, to I suppose, live our, our second dream. The, the farm was sort of never big enough to support mum and dad and Jenny and I and brother and sister as well, so we've had to uh, diversify a bit. The company has sent countless sawmills to remote parts of Australia where freighting in building materials can be prohibitively costly. Instead, timber can be milled on site. So we've had people write to us and say the timber that they've been able to mill off their farm has meant they've been able to keep going and maybe save their farm after a period of drought. There are countless stories of people who have built their own houses and, in some cases, rebuilt their lives. After Victoria's disastrous Black Saturday bushfires, this portable mill help salvage millions of lineal metres of blackened timber. And it's not just farm uses, such as cattle yards or farm buildings. For this manufacturing business at Balan, west of Melbourne, the Lucas Mill is indispensable. It's getting harder and harder to source timber. Uh, we have to freight it in. We don't have control over the moisture content. 
Um, so it's been a, a, a thing we've been building up uh, where we can supply ourselves our own timber and uh, we actually live you know, in the wombat forest and there's so many trees that fall down and, and aren't utilised. Nick Deere used it to cut the massive beams to build this traditional style house, built almost entirely without nails. Now he's using timber that would often go for firewood, such as this messmate log. After being sawn and dried in a kiln, this timber will be worth at least 20 times more than if it simply went to stoke the fire. It's, it's just a fantastic concept that it's so portable and amenable. Oh, it's been amazing for us because we can source local timber. Um, we've, we've made everything from uh, houses to uh, stages, windows, furniture, you name it, we can use, uh, you know, get different logs. Being uh, a joinery timber, it will, it will go on and on and on being used into future generations. These high-class timber tables are made from salvaged logs, as are the frames for these double-glazed, eco-friendly windows. We've got some English oak in here that came out of Ballarat Gardens, I think. They had to knock a tree down. So rather than just chopping it up, we've, we can make you know, exclusive little ranges of stuff. Usable, often valuable timber doesn't just grow in the bush. So there's really good quality trees growing in suburban backyards and that was a big part of our initial market. In nations such as Papua New Guinea, the mill is allowing sustainable development. It allows the locals to compete with the big foreign companies that come in and knock the whole jungle down. They can go in and selectively log with this type of mill and let all the other stuff continue to grow, whereas uh, the big companies are a bit, just come in and plunder and knock it all down and plant uh, oil palm or something like that. And that's the end of the jungle. But this is a, a more sustainable process. Last year, aided by a falling Australian dollar, the factory turned out a record number of machines, around a thousand. Last year was the biggest year we've, we've ever had, which as an Australian manufacturer, when you look at what's happening with Holden and Ford and Toyota, it's uh, pleasing that we can still wave the, the Aussie manufacturing flag. It's a very successful mill and, and the fact that they're still going all these years later um, and exporting all over the world is a big thing that the Lucas family have done and they've employed a lot of people and given them you know, a good thing for the, the area. It's fantastic how, you know, we're very proud of it being an Australian invention as well. Along the way, the family has made many inventions, big and small. For example, their dedicated slabber. It's basically a vertical shaft engine driving a, a really large chainsaw, and uh, we make specialty slabbers that can cut slabs up to nine foot three wide, which... Uh, People in New Zealand are digging ancient cowrie that's been dead for maybe 50,000 years and buried in peat swamps and digging that up and making massive conference tables. Really high value timber. The, the people that dig this timber out of the ground might get $10,000 for, for a big cowrie slab. It's uh, quite amazing and our machine's almost the only machine available on the market that can cut slabs of that size. Nice looking bit of crutch timber clipping because mm. it's got that bit of fold in it. Feature wood. We're uh, sailing pretty well, and uh, uh, there's a few ideas I've still got in my mind that can streamline this a bit more. It has been quite a journey. Tell you what, we have learned a lot. Learned a lot about patents, we've learned a lot about different cultures. It's, it's been a, I suppose it's been a privilege to have the opportunity to meet the people we have, travel to the places we have, and just... Um, yeah, you know, it's never a chore. I come to work every morning and I don't feel like it's a chore. I love it.